long ago, when I was in college, I studied the field of astronomy and was very interested in a particular branch of astronomy called cosmology. Not to be confused with cosmetology, which I know sounds alike, but is very different. Uh, cosmology was the study of the universe, of its shape, of how we think about what it is, and its origins and its destiny. Turns out, as I studied it uh, in human history, we've always been interested in that question. Where are we? What's out there? Where is here? And where is it all headed? Have been some of the questions that you can follow back as far as ancient Samaria or ancient Greece all the way down to our present time. And the answers have changed through the years in some measure. Uh, some of them have been better answers than others. Uh, as recently as 100 years ago, we still thought that our uh, galaxy was the full extent of the universe. Um, you see the big charts now of the, the Webb uh, Space Telescope showing us distant galaxies. We had no idea they even existed, let alone see them. As recently as 100 years ago, we still thought the edges of the map were our galaxy. Uh, it's a constantly changing field. Uh, and what you think about what the universe looks like, what reality looks like, will very much shape the way you live in it. Because ultimately, when you tell people what the universe looks like, you're telling some kind of story. It's not just a map. You're saying, here's what's going on out there and in here. So for the next couple of weeks, I want to talk about uh, if you want to call it cosmology, you can. I'm going to call it places. Uh, I'm going to talk about three places that the Old Testament scriptures describe for us. They give us a, a worldview of how to see out there and in here. It's a very ancient view. Turns out it's a very useful view. And if you understand the pieces of the map as it portrays it, you can tell the entire story of the Bible through the three places described in the ancient literature. In reading in the Old Testament, you'll notice there are basically three places. There's where you are, and then there's as far as you can go one way, and as far as you can go the other way. So for example, Isaiah says to King Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Heaven is as high as you could go. That was where God was. And Sheol was the grave, the Hebrew word for the place of the dead. Wherever dead folks go, that's as far as you could go the other way. We're here, they're there, he's up there, and those are the edges of the map. You can see that again in Psalm 115, 16. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. And I forgot to make a slide of it, but the next verse actually said... The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, the earth he's given to man, silent are those who go to the grave. Three places is the way the Old Testament people thought about the universe and their kind of mental map of what's out there and where am I. The place where God is, some place we all go and we die, and where we are today was sufficient for them to kind of understand what things looked like. It's all they needed. It was a useful way of thinking about the world. There were three basic places. A place for God, a place for me, and a place for the dead was all that they needed of a map. I'm not telling you those are the only possible places. I'm not telling you there's more to the story. Uh, of course, in the New Testament, when Christ is raised from the dead, Paul says, Christ brought immortality to light by the gospel. We get a clearer picture because of Christ and what he accomplished. But this ancient picture is still useful, so just stay with me a little bit. And for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to take one of these at a time and say, what is the story, the Old Testament in particular, into the New, tells us about our place on the map? And we're going to start with the idea of heaven. In the New Testament, the idea of heaven comes up a lot. And so today's uh, text, this is kind of a topical sermon, so I'm going to hop around a lot. But if I have to pick a text, it's this one. 
Luke chapter 6, 22 to 24. Blessed are you when people hate you and they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. And woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. This is in Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in Luke called the Sermon on the Plain, story for another day. But it's, it's one of Jesus' most famous sermons, and in it he quite frequently says things like, great is your reward in heaven. What is he trying to teach us? What's the, the doctrine of heaven? And what does Jesus mean when he says that there is some kind of reward to be had in heaven? I think there's a lot of good pictures of it. I think there's a really large list of terrible pictures of what we imagine these passages might be about. And I want to just kind of flip through the pages of Scripture and see if we can get a sense of what it's actually trying to say. First of all, the concept of reward is based on God's justice. As I said, these places aren't just maps. It's what we think about the whole universe. Do you believe that there is a God who at the end of time or somewhere in between makes things right, that he's just and he's fair, and people who have tried or done something to get his attention or believed in him or fill in the blank, whatever your religion says, right? Do you believe that there is a God out there who is fair is the big question. If the answer is yes, you look at this current life and you say, I'm sure not getting it right now. I think God is fair, I don't currently think life is fair. And so one of the reasons we believe in that place, in that concept of a reward to come, is because we trust that God is going to make things right. Hebrews says it this way, Hebrews 6 and verse 10, For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. In other words, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, it has to matter. Side note, just because I'm me for a minute. Uh, the modern picture of the universe doesn't give you that answer, by the way. In the modern picture of the cosmos, you're just one speck of stardust and a very large pile of stardust that's mostly empty anyway. And it doesn't have to matter. If you're good, if you're bad, if you're nice, if you're kind, if you're hateful, if you're mean, it really doesn't matter. The universe doesn't care. But if you believe in a God who is just, then the writer says that has to matter. This life you're living has significance and meaning. And it's because I believe there is a God and that, guy, that God is not unjust, double negative, God is just. And he's not going to overlook your work. Again, double negative. He is going to see your life, and your life is going to matter. Later in the same book, he says it this way. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Like the, the whole center of the beginning of faith, the first step of faith, is, is there a God in this universe, and does he care what I'm doing? If you think there's no God in the universe, we don't care about the second question. On the other hand, if you think there is a God in the universe and he doesn't care about you, then it really didn't matter that there was a God in the universe. So Hebrews says, these are the things that our faith begins with. I believe there is a God. I believe he's going to make it right. I believe he is just. He is more than just. And he's going to sort things out that are wrong before it's all over. So the first thing we'd say about why do we think about heaven or this idea of a reward it's actually rooted in the idea that there is a God who is just and he's going to make things right. Now there you have to immediately pause and the preacher has to give you a warning and wag his finger a little bit. That does not mean that the plan should be for you to live really, really well and earn your way into that reward. On the one hand, yes, we believe that God is just, on the other hand, we think there is something better than just, and God's that too. That on the one hand, yes, my life does matter. Yes, there is significance. God is paying attention. But if that's true, he also sees all my failures. What if I'm one of the mistakes he has to correct at the end? 
What if making things right means getting rid of Ben? See the problem? If God were to take all the people who were problems in the world and say, not them, not them, not them, not them, well, the fact that he's just stops being appealing very quickly because I'm one of the not thems, right? The only way that God can be just and that could be good news for any, for any way, shape, or form for me is that there is an act of God's graciousness that goes with it. Romans summarizes it, these simple words, Romans chapter 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. On the one hand, yes, God is fair, yes, your life does matter, yes, he is just. On the other, if he was really just going to dole out exactly what you deserve, your paycheck would say death, which is next week's lesson. Right, the other place. If he was really doling out it, justice and fairness in, the, in that sense, that sense of severity, he wouldn't say, y'all come and be with me. He'd say, get as far away from me as possible. But that's not what God does. God is just, and he is paying attention, and your life does matter, and your life does have significance, and he's grading on a curve. And he's looking at your life, and he's not seeing your failures and mistakes and flaws and catastrophes. He's seen his son, Jesus Christ, who is made possible by his love and his blood for God to see something better in, the, in you than you would even see in yourself. God's not only just, he's better than just, he's graciously just. And that's part of the, the doctrine that makes the idea of heaven possible for any of us. So what then do we mean in the third place when we say great is your reward in heaven? In the New Testament, you'll notice a trend based on those first two things. What you do matters. God's grading on a curve. You'll notice a trend in all of the heaven passages of the New Testament. Always they are emphasizing a challenge given to us to seek our consequences in God's justice and graciousness rather than in our own. Okay? If there is no God, I better enjoy life because I'm the only person that matters in the universe anyway. If there is a God and he's not just or gracious or kind, then same applies. He's not looking out for me, so I'd better look out for me. But if there is a God who is true, who is gracious, who is loving, who is kind, then now the challenge to me is, can I live my life in this place, anticipating the person in that place will sort things out. Can I look past what I see right in front of my face and believe in something greater and someone greater who's working on my behalf? Notice the passages in the New Testament that talk about heaven and see if they don't all emphasize that point. And when you pray, this is Sermon on the Mount stuff, Matthew 6, 5 through 6. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, for they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Right? So what are they doing? They're praying, and they want to be praised by people. They are looking at what's right in front of them. They are not looking for their consequence somewhere else. They're not trusting in God to say, this is what it's going to be. They are saying, I need right now the satisfaction of being told I'm doing a good job. And Jesus says, they get it. They have now, in this place where you live, their reward. Congrats. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Right? If you can look past right now and stop looking for the immediate gratification and satisfaction that you want and trust that what God has in mind for you is far better then the God who sees in secret can offer you something far better. And then just a few verses down in the same chapter, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break through and steal. Of course, in the context, to spread that verse out a little bit, the previous verses say, don't look for treasures on earth. Why? They're not any good. They're lousy. They break down. They fall apart. They decay. Why do we want them then? Because they're right in front of us. It's the low-hanging fruit. It's right there. I can feel like my life had meaning because I had this thing for a few seconds. God says there's something far better 
to trust that God is good, to trust that God is just, to trust that he's making it worthwhile, that he's making it matter, and to anticipate the consequences of your life, not right here in front of you, but in his place and his time and a world to come. Matthew 19, 21, Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, this is to the rich young ruler, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. What's he saying? I don't think, for what it's worth, that Jesus is trying to bribe the young man. Uh, if you'll follow me, I've got something better for you. I think what he's saying is this is the challenge of believing there is a God in heaven. The challenge is, are you looking for your satisfaction now, or are you willing to look for your satisfaction later? Are you looking for what's going to make your life valuable now, or are you anticipating that there is a God beyond our place and time? who's looking out for you. And because of that now, I can not just not care to seek my reward now, I could give away my reward now. I don't even need it. Everything that could make my life comfortable, I can give away because I believe there's a God in heaven and I believe he's just and I believe he's good and I believe it matters. See the point? It's two completely different views of the world. If I'm just a pale blue dot in the universe and that's all there is, then I better get everything I can enjoy right now. But if there is a God in heaven, if there's more to the story than what I see, then I can look further down the road and see what's possible. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19, here's Paul saying the same thing. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. So they may take hold of that which is truly life. See the theme again? It'll shock you if you look through the New Testament how often the theme of God will reward you later and get rid of your stuff now goes together in a sentence in the New Testament. That it's not a bribe. It's not saying, if you do what I say and you're a good Christian, I'll give you something nice at the end. It's a challenge. Do you actually believe this? If I am living today like this is all that matters, then no, I don't believe there is a God in heaven. I don't believe that he wants me to be with him. I'm not living like it. I am living like a person who believes his joy is entirely up to him. Paul says, don't be that way. You want to be rich? Be rich in good works. Be poor in wealth. Be rich in love. And give away what you have because you believe fervently and passionately with conviction that what will make meaning for your life is not what you have in your pocket now, but for the God who awaits in a place unseen. So now at last we come back to Luke, which I said was kind of our text. And listen again with all that in mind to what Jesus actually said in these verses. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil, or account on the count of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap up for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, so their, so their fathers did it to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. It's the same point. Again, and I hope you're, you're getting this. I don't think Jesus is trying to say, uh, if you're so righteous, I'll give you so much heavenly gold or something like that, or some kind of bartering. You have nothing to offer God. If this is a, a market exchange, you've got nothing to give. And what he has to give is not something you could afford anyway. That can't be the point of what the doctrine of heaven is. The question is, every one of us is looking for our life to have some meaning. Where is that meaning located? If it's here, then this is what you've got. Jesus is very candid about it. See at the end of that verse, woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. If it's here, then you have what you've got. He doesn't even make a, a stern condemnation, just said, sad for you. You get the, the irony of that. I think Jesus is funny sometimes. Sad for you, all you get is to be rich. All you get is to be wealthy. How pathetic. He's sad. It's not a rebuke. It's sadness. It's remorse for a person who can't see any more of the universe than the money in front of them. 
He says, but if you believe there's a God in heaven, then when you're mocked, when you're ridiculed, when you're shamed, when people intentionally make your life as difficult as they possibly can, he says, you sing a song, you rejoice, because it's proof to you that you've really believed in something. You've actually believed in someone else and something else and somewhere else. You've actually believed there is a God who makes things right. Your suffering now is like a testimony to you that you have put your faith somewhere else. So in a few verses, he'll continue it. Love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you'll be sons of the Most High for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. The God who's been pretty good to everybody, even the people who don't deserve it, that God intends to be kind to you. The question of heaven is not just a question of some kind of uh, eternal gold mansion or something like that, some kind of bribe that we cash out so many good works for so many golden streets or something like that. It's a whole other question. The question is, where are we looking for the meaning and purpose of our life? If you think it's all about getting yours right now, then hate your enemies, take what you can get, keep it, enjoy it, or as the certain rich fool once said, soul, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But if you think there is a God in heaven and he wants you to be with him, put all your chips over there. Every hope, every aspiration, every intention, every desire, every everything, put it in him and anticipate what he has more than anything being offered to you today. I believe God's offer of reward in heaven is not a bribe, it is a challenge. It is something that's supposed to make you look at your life now differently. I'll say it again. The doctrine of heaven is supposed to change your view of earth. It's supposed to make you look at what you have and say, am I doing this? Am I having this? Am I holding this? Am I guarding this? Am I cherishing this because I believe this is what matters? Or am I doing it to please a God whose story is not yet finished? It is a challenge that we so rarely live up to. You bow with me in a word of prayer. Our Father, our God, help us to believe in you more. Help us to believe that there is a place where you dwell in unapproachable light. Help us to believe that you and your infinite justice are also infinitely kind and gracious. Help us to believe and to act as people you want to dwell with forever. Help us to believe and to act as people who want to be with you. Help us to be carefree of the anxieties of the present age, anticipating the glory that is to be revealed in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.